introducing our first speaker. Um, so our first speaker is Dr Chiara Scrocco, who is a cardiologist and research fellow at St George's uh, Hospital, St George's University of London. Um, she was part of the panel that actually gave the ESC webinar about this topic, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing her talk, which will be around the updates that are relevant to ICC from the 2022 uh, ESC guidelines for the management of patients with ventricular arrhythmias and the prevention of sudden death. So welcome, Chiara. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for the kind invitation. I hope you hear me OK. So I'll try to share my uh, slides and you please let me know if everything is OK. Can you see my slides? We can. Thanks, Chiara. So yes, I'll try to give you uh, an overview of the last ESC guidelines. Um, as you know, <laughs> this is a, a huge document of more than 130 pages with well, more than 100 new recommendations. Of course, it's massive, a lot of information. I try to squeeze everything in the next uh, 20 minutes and I uh, try to focus on 10 main points. Uh, which uh, are highlighted here. So uh, let's start with the first. Of course, you know, sudden cardiac death is uh, uh, very common and is estimated to affect um, 300,000 people in Europe alone every year. So it's a huge public, uh, public health issue. And the thing is that we know that CPR improves su survival and the guidelines, of course, stress this uh, a lot. So they recommend that um, public access to the fibrillation should be available in all sites, or, you know, with crowds, uh, stadiums, uh, public transport stations, etc. Uh, prompt CPR by bystanders, of course, is recommended and is also recommended to promote community training in CPR and the use of external defibrillators. Uh, one of the novelty here is that um, a mobile phone based alerting of basic life support trained by standards could be considered. Of course, this is um, maybe experimental for the time being, also due to organizational issues, but uh, maybe in the future this would be more um, widespread. Uh, second uh, novelty, this is very interesting, is the introduction of these uh, clinical scenarios for the initial presentation of uh, uh, ventricular arrhythmias in subjects without known cardiac conditions. So this is very handy, especially for the general cardiologist and um, are presented as an algorithm, so a flowchart. Um, in those five uh, cases. So the incidental finding of a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, a first presentation of a sustained monomorphic VT, uh, what to do in case of a sudden cardiac arrest survivor, a sudden cardiac death victim. But uh, the very new thing is what to do in the relative. So what we uh, do routinely in our clinic, and is very nice, uh, nicely explained. I will just show you here uh, one of the flow charts. Sorry, it's a bit small. Uh, so sudden death victim, uh, what to do first? Uh, of course, anamnesis, et cetera. Uh, the autopsy is recommended in class one. So it's very important. Of course, this may have logistic issues again, but it's um, it's very important. And then from, from there, we can go down. There is a mention of the potential use of genetic testing, so important to keep bloods. And from that, negative autopsy if we are in front of a sad case, so sudden arrhythmia death syndrome, uh, what we need to do, of course, screen the family. So there is a very nice flowchart on what to do in the family members as well. And this is very, very new. Third point, uh, a focus on the managing of electrical storm, which is defined as uh, three 
uh, events uh, during uh, the 24 hours. Of course, uh, many recommendations were already present in the previous guidelines on what to do, especially in terms of um, medical treatment. Uh, but this is the first time there is a separate chapter. And again, we have two nice, uh, a very nice flowchart uh, with uh, um, divided in structural versus uh, non-structural abnormalities and also on the type of the arrhythmia. Uh, if it's more monomorph monomorphic or polymorphic. So um, uh, following to this, uh, the management also includes indications uh, in the uh, use of antiarrhythmic drug, of course, reprogramming of the ICD, uh, deep sedation, but also includes recommendation on the catheter ablation. So that should be considered in patients with recurrent episodes, uh, non responsive to medical treatment. Another new point is the upgrade on genetic counseling and genetic testing. As you know, this has, um, has had, is having uh, um, a lot of um, um, a lot of discussions over the last year, so a lot of improvement and advancement uh, alongside the uh, more common use of genetic testing. So the guideline explained this very well uh, and the recommendations, of course, have increased since last time. We had something mentioned in 2015, especially regarding subjects with a suspected cardiomyopathy or a subjects with the, um, uh, SADS. Uh, the families, of course, but uh, in this case, we have a, a lot more of evidence and recommendations on what to do, especially also for genetic testing of the family, so uh, cascade screening. And we have a, a specific disease recommendation, especially regarding dilated cardiomyopathy or hypokinetic non dilated cardiomyopathy, as, as you can see, class one recommendation for the first time on uh, genetic testing, investigating for lamine, phospholambane, uh, RBM20 and filamin C genes. Uh, of course, the guidelines stress the importance of a multi a team approach with genetic counselor, uh, explaining the families, the outcome of the genetic testing, paying a lot of attention to the variant classification, the need to reclassify the variants, segregation studies. So uh, all is very well explained and also goes hand to hand with the guidelines uh, for genetic testing in ICCs that are on a separate document. Uh, the fifth point is the increased relevance of uh, cardiac MRI. As you know, this uh, is uh, nowadays very um, widespread, whereas in 2015 the recommendations were only two. So, for example, if the echocardiogram did not provide uh, an accurate assessment of the ventricle or uh, when finding some abnormalities in athletes, for example, or after the finding of persistent myocardial inflammation. Whereas now we can see guideline uh, MRI in many conditions, structural heart disease uh, without coronary uh, heart disease suspected, frequent um, premature ventricular contractions, not typical uh, origin, all survivors of sudden cardiac arrest. And this was again in the scenario um, that I showed you earlier, for example, in the relatives of descendants of SADS, for example, if we suspect some underlying condition in patients with suspected um, structural inheritable conditions, ARVC, HCM, uh, DCM, or suspect PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. And there's also mention of the potential role of late gadolinium enhancement um, uh, to uh, better stratify the risk for the first time. Of course, uh, the guidelines do not go deep into the specific requirements or technicalities of the MRI, but it's a good start for this to become more more and more important. Uh, another part, another new thing is algorithms for antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Of course, antiarrhythmic drug therapy is a staple of the guidelines for sudden cardiac death prevention. So many things uh, were already present, but for the first time here, uh, we have two algorithms for the use of um, um, sodium channel blocker drugs and drugs that can potentially prolong the QT interval. This is because we know that uh, both these, cla these classes can actually increase the risk of ventricular tachycardia, uh, 
and um, the risk of sudden death. So there is a nice, again, flow chart on what to do uh, in patients uh, with structural heart condition, for example, where we shouldn't give sodium channel blocker, blockers and what to look for. So the ECG, QRS prolongation, etc. Whereas for the long QT prolonging drugs, uh, great attention to the other precipitating factors, uh, liver impairment, electrolyte imbalance, and so on. So again, very easy to read, easy to understand, and very useful for the general cardiologist. Uh, another key point is the increasing value of catheter ablation for the management of ventricular uh, arrhythmias. So we have a class one recommendation for patients with symptomatic idiopathic VT and ectopic beats from the RVOT or left ventricular fascicles and PVC-related cardiomyopathy independent of the presumed origin. Also some indication about uh, PVCs from other origins and if the burden of ectopic beats is very high, uh, even if the patient is asymptomatic, this class two recommendation. Then another interesting thing is the pre preference for ablation to instead of escalating antiarrhythmic drug therapy in patients with uh, um, uh, persistent arrhythmias um, despite medical therapy. Uh, and again, an alternative to ICD uh, in patients with ischemic heart disease, but hemodynamically tolerated um, sustained monomorphic VT and preserve the only reduced, mildly reduced ejection fraction. And also some indication in ICC's condition, so dilated cardiomyopathy and HCM with again a stable VT. And also something on Brigada, so Brigada patients with drug refractory uh, recurrent appropriate ICD shocks uh, in whom we can uh, see the VF triggering um, ectopic beats or they have a characteristic uh, RBOT substrate. Um, in, alongside this, we have a focus on a more individualized uh, sudden cardiac death risk stratification. Of course, this is the big question in uh, all our efforts in trying to prevent sudden death. Uh, as you may know, the previous guidelines uh, mentioned uh, were mainly focused on the ejection fraction, so a number and the presence of symptoms of heart failure with the cutoff of 35% in class near um, 2-3. Um, but after the publication of the Danish study, which was uh, published shortly after actually, uh, this recommendation was declassified to 2A uh, due to the uh, lower evidence of benefit in this group, uh, patients with DCM. Um, alongside this, other um, disease-specific recommendation in DCM uh, would mention about the genetic background actually, so patients with the Lamin uh, genetic variants who are more at risk, uh, sh we should consider the ICD. This is all very new. Um, and also uh, some mention of patients with ARBC uh, in whom uh, ICD can be considered in the presence of uh, LV dysfunction um, and evidence of arrhythmias. Uh, alongside this, there is a renaissance of EP studies, uh, basically in uh, coronary artery disease, uh, and I explained syn syncope, uh, EP study is indicated. There is also some indication in ARBC. We can do the study and try to uh, trigger arrhythmias. And again, in Brugada syndrome, the P study, which is always debated, uh, received the class 2B recommendation for the risk gratification in the subjects with no symptoms, but has spontaneous type 1 uh, pattern. Then uh, point nine, we have the implementation of risk scores and risk calculators. This is again, trying to better tailor our therapies uh, for each patient. As you know, the HCM calculator was present in the previous guidelines, but it was only validated on adults. This time we have the introduction of the pediatric risk scores, which um, um, is used for subjects aged 1 to 16, of course, without previous arrhythmias. And again, we have a um, score calculator for patients with DCM and Lamin variants. 
uh, again, um, this has been published and validated. And the last one introdu introduced by the guidelines is the 123 LQTS risk score. Uh, and this is uh, uh, this is the, this uh, all these calculators are available online, so it's pretty helpful and handy for the clinical practice to go and evaluate the five risk uh, of these conditions. The guideline use uh, specific cutoffs, but these calculators are have been introduced, so they can uh, potentially be uh, used and give additional information. So uh, the guidelines stress on their use as well. And last but not least, the last chapter is the changes in primary uh, electrical diseases. This is a very big chapter in the last guidelines and is very comprehensive. There have been so many changes. So uh, just to mention the uh, most uh, uh, important, the biggest, First, we have a new chapter on the early repolarization pattern and syndrome that was completely absent from the previous guidelines uh, due to the lack of uh, um, uh, much literature, actually. So now we have the definition, treatment, and a bit of um, th therapy. Idiopathic BF, this follows the, uh, the nice and comprehensive scenario on um, sudden cardiac arrest and the unexplained cardiac arrest. So we have a definition of IVF and again mention about the therapy and the risk stratification. There is a new um, definition uh, of short QT syndrome, new uh, diagnostic criteria for short QT syndrome, some changes in treatment of long QT3 with the introduction of mexilitin in the guidelines as well and about long QT7 we will see the separate um, separate um, uh, classification and a lot of changes in Brugada, in Brugada syndrome. Uh, this is big because last guidelines, as you may remember, Brugada syndrome was defined in the presence of a simple Brugada pattern, um, but uh, the guidelines here uh, divide this a bit more. So we have a class one recommendation in the presence of uh, spontaneous type one, but actually in the presence of an agemaline induced uh, class one C uh, induced Brugada, the diagnosis can be made only in the presence of additional features such as clinical symptoms, family history, sudden death, um, etc. This is because of the evidence of some uh, rate of false positive with uh, uh, sodium channel blockers. Uh, and of course, the worry about overdiagnosis of Brugada. So the diagnosis uh, criteria have changed for Brugada. Uh, there are also, uh, as mentioned before, additional indication about risk stratification with the use of EP study also for asymptomatic patients with a spontaneous type 1. And uh, um, the uh, use of um, ablation in case of refractory arrhythmia, as mentioned earlier. So uh, just to wrap up uh, all, these, uh, all these key points that I mentioned, uh, I would say that from the last guidelines, the new document uh, stresses uh, and put a lot of, of emphasis on the genetic counseling and genetic testing, and also cardiac MRI, which have increasingly gained relevance uh, in both in the diagnosis, but also risk stratification of um, uh, conditions related to uh, sudden death and ventricular arrhythmias, uh, very important in ICCs, but um, the cardiac MRI will probably gain more importance in all cardiac conditions. Uh, catheter ablation uh, is increasingly important for the treatment of these patients. We are seeing some changes also in classical uh, diseases such as uh, um, ischemic heart disease and the role of programmed electrical stimulation for risk certification. So uh, something new, something is changing also there. Instead of a one size fits all approach, we are now seeing a tendency towards a more personalized assessment of the risk. And this takes into account, uh, of course, symptoms, structural features, but also uh, genotype and uh, potentially the use of a risk uh, 
uh, scores will help us in um, improving this more and more. So we shall see the next uh, the next guidelines. So from it, thanks.